Father God, we just come to you, Lord. We are so thankful and so grateful for all that you do in our life, Lord, for bringing each of us back together again as a group, Lord, to be able to spend time to, to learn your word, Father God. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just lift up these prayer requests to you, Father God. Lord, I lift up Alicia's surgery to you that's coming up, Father God. I just ask, Lord, that you would just guide the... I'm on a call, son. Lord, I ask that you would just... Um, there'd be a quick recovery, Father God, that there'd be no um, issues with them from this surgery, Father. Lord, I also um, lift up her son, Brayden, to you, Father God, that you would just give him a sense of direction, Father God. Lord, that um, he would just draw his life closer and closer to you, Father God. And Lord, that he would walk out this um, life of faith. I pray, Father God, that um, you would just put him on a straight path, Lord. Lord, I'll also lift up um, her friend Amy to you, Father God. We just pray for healing, for complete healing, Lord, that we would just touch her brain, Father God. We know that you are a God that, can, that heals and provides miracles, Lord. I just ask, Father God, that your healing hand would rest upon that brain, Father God. And we just rebuke that cancer right now in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. We tell it to go right now in Jesus' name that you have no authority over, over Amy. And we pray and we believe, Father God, that there will be a testimony that comes out of this, Father God. Glory, Father. I pray, Lord, that as she goes through chemo, Father God, and radiation or whatever the treatment is that she's doing, Father God, that um, that it would be um, as painless as possible, Father God. Lord, I lift up Curtis, Father God, and his family to you, Lord. I pray and rebuke the spirit of pride that's within this family, Father God. I pray, Lord, um, that you would bring them each to a place of forgiveness, Lord, with each other, whatever issues that they have in this family, Father God. I just pray, Lord, that you would bring unity and that your spirit, Father God, would um, convict each of their hearts, Lord, where they, with whatever they need to do, Father God, to love one another. Thank you, Jesus. That they would die to their flesh, Father God. Lord, I lift up uh, James to you, Father God, and um, with Misty and, and her mom and uh, granddaughter, Father God, and pray just for traveling mercies, Lord God, that you'd be a hedge of protection, Father God, for them while they're on the road and on the flight, Lord God, that you would just get them safely to where they're going and home again, Father God. Lord, I lift up also Frank to you, Father God, and I just pray for direction with whatever's going on. Um, Lord, I just ask that you would open up the right door, Father God. And Lord, as he's, he's waiting and he's um, desperately pursuing you, Father God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just give him that spirit of peace, Lord. The, the, the right opportunity will come across his path, Father God, and he'll know it's from you. Lord, I also lift up Quinn to you, Father God, and his, his father-in-law not feeling well, Father God. We just pray for healing, Lord. And Lord, we just lift up his mom to you, Father God. I pray, Lord, that um, wherever you want her, Lord, that you would just give her peace and the ability to stay where she's supposed to be, Father God. And if she's supposed to move again, Lord, I just pray that, um, that right the right door would open up. You would be able to know how to do it where she's at, Father God. And we just thank you for all these things, Lord. I pray that you would give John, Lord, and just that you would minister to um, this group, Lord, tonight, that you would just speak through him, Father God, that our ears would be open, our spirits would receive from you, Father God. Father, I'd like to interject. I'd like to also add, I'd like to pray for Samantha on our Facebook, Father, for our other members of our church and for Zach who just joined us. Uh, Father, you know what he's going through with his travels in Africa. I'd like to pray for families, our family, for others that are going through anything within their family, whether it's Christian families or not Christian families, for all families that need your help to bond together, to be more in uniform, unison, to be understanding of one another. Father, that we don't bring this stuff with us day to day when we have bad days. Father, we find a way to forgive, forgive one another. And I pray for our kids and grandkids and extended family and Father God, I just pray for anybody in need, any church in need, any ministry in need. I just wanted to add that. Yes, Lord. So we just give you this time now, Father God, and that you would just be in the center of each of every one of our homes, Lord. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Brother, Zach, uh, Brother Zach, what's going on, sir? 
Oh man, just doing some preaching, man. Uh, doing some preaching, and uh, just got off work. All right. I got off work like at uh two ten. Started preaching, so I'm fixing to finish up. I just had to join, and I just wanted y'all to know that I I'm preaching right now. I wanted to make it, but I'm fixing to start preaching again. So. That's Dude, awesome. hey, you, you, we're here with you, man. We're a team. Do what you got to do. It's all love. And the the sun, the the message for the day was Matthew five sixteen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Come on, man. Amen. Yes, sir. Hey, Zach. I want to let you know before you leave, Mr. Quinn. You can't see him on the video right now, but he's joining no. us. He's the first. He was a guy that actually gave us this idea. There he is. Remember Quinn? Hello. Hey, man, what's up? Good to see you again. Yeah, man. It's good to see you, too. Yeah, I remember him. I remember him from your yeah. house. Yeah. 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 Awesome, boy. Good. You got to go, Zach? Yeah, I got to go, man. I'm fixing to get back at it. Start well, screaming at some the, people about Jesus. The devil in the teeth. Let's, get, let's get on with it. Yes, All sir. Right. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Love you, Zach. We'll try to speed this up next time or we we try to get into this by, you know, like 645 next time. But um, okay. are we ready? We love you, Zach. Love you, too. Love you, man. I don't want to have y'all wait too long. We love Zach. Uh, are we guys, are we ready, everybody? I'm ready. Okay, we're in okay. Acts chapter 13. Listen, last week, so we're in the book of Acts. Everybody knows I'm going to make it simple. Luke, the physician, the Gentile, obviously wrote the book of Acts. He wrote the book of Luke. This is kind of like part two to the book of Luke, and that's about all you're going to get on that. Um, so he's writing to Theophilus, God lover, friend of God, whatever you want to call it. Um, we're not going to go into that. But anyway, Acts the last week was Acts chapter 12. And so Peter, uh, we, we had two people that really notable to me were Peter, and I think one was Herod, correct? Herod Agrippa. And so last week in Acts chapter 12, it starts out, you think Peter's going to get in prison, he's in prison, and Herod's, you know, Herod's free, but yet Herod ends up dying, and Peter gets set free, and angel sets him free, and so what's, what's interesting in the last chapter, it says that um, the angel smote Peter, which gently knocked, you no. know, what's that? Didn't smoke Peter. Was well, said, actually, it said he Not smoked Peter. Peter. And, and Herod. Oh, that's yeah. right. But that's good, she's paying attention. <laughs> so he actually says, she's right, though. So the angel had two different smitings in chapter 12, but one of them was a gentle hit to wake up Peter, but Herod had an aggressive hit, uh, hit to, put, <laughs> to put Herod to sleep. And so um, I think it's interesting there were two different kinds of hitting. One was gentle, one was rough. So basically King Herod uh, died and worms came out of him. We talked all about that. Yeah. Um, and Peter set free. What was that? I just was laughing. I've just read that. So he was consumed with worms and died. <laughs> we did. And we talked about last week, though, interestingly enough, when it, when it says he was consumed with worms, um, it said, let me find it right here. There was actually a worm. Now, this is, this is a belief. I don't know this to be absolutely true. Excuse me. But when it talks about him being hit with worms, I want to find this really quick. Um, there was actually a worm called a dog. I think it's called a dog worm. I think that's what it was. Yeah, that it's believed to be a dog worm, and it gets on the right side of your of your liver, and it's from handling livestock. It's like a tapeworm. And so uh, there are some scholars that believe it was a the bursting of the, these blisters from this tapeworm, his liver bursting. And, and, and if you look at some of the writings, the historical writings like Josephus, which we read from, I think, mm -hmm. Flavius Josephus, now, again, we don't know this to be true, but it's likely he had a tapeworm that's caused from lot handling livestock. And so just a fun, interesting thing to look into, I guess. Frank, have you ever looked into this at all or not really? No, well, no, I'm I really looking, haven't looked into I'm it. I'm kind of looking in mine and it says, uh, Harold died a horrible death. Let me get my glasses. I can't read this thing. I'm going blind. They don't make these Bibles big enough anymore. Accompanied by intense pain, he was literally eaten alive from the inside out by worms. To be eaten by worms was considered to be one of the most 
disgraceful ways to die. Pride is a serious mm, sin. You know. And in this case, God chose to punish it immediately. God does not immediately punish all sin, but he will bring all to judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. God hates pride. Except yeah. Christ offer for forgiveness today, no one can afford to wait. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. You know, what's interesting about that real quick is that, you know, when if I remember correctly, they, they said, oh, you have the voice of a God. You know, they were, they were, you know, making him feel good. And the fact that he didn't say, no, I'm not a God. He basically, you know, when he, uh, he, he basically, he took the glory on himself and he died. It's very important. when somebody says, man, you're so good, you know, you know, your Bible, you're whatever man of God. Look, it's all God's glory. Remember right. this is scripture. Chapter 12 should be a real big lesson that somebody should ring in their ear that if somebody paints a picture and they call you, man, what's that brother Curtis, man, you're awesome. You're awesome. No, man, if I'm good, anything you see that's good on me to God be the glory because Right here in chapter 12 last week, we see what happens when you don't give God the glory. Well, at least it did in that chapter. So, right. so uh, yeah. So um, anything else? I'm going to move on to 13 and we'll get going. So this week, Acts chapter 13, we're introduced to, uh, we're going to find out something about Saul that changes. He gets a new name, as you guys I'm sure know. Um, and he goes on his first missionary journey. There's going to be, I think, three. Is that correct? Three or four? We'll find out. Um, I might be ahead of myself. But this is his first missionary journey. And he takes some. He takes a trip, we're going to find out. He makes some specific stops, I think, for very specific reasons. And um, beautiful prayers. Thank you, Miss Samantha. We love you. And so we're going to find out some things that happen. We're going to find out that we're going to be introduced to uh, John Mark who wrote the book, uh, excuse me, Mark from the book of Mark, but we find oh. out there's some jealousy. There's some separation. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to learn some new interesting stuff here. So Paul's going to take a journey. We're going to go ahead and start uh, verse one real quick. Um, a lot of people call that this has been called my mom's here. That makes me so happy. My mom's been on vacation. I haven't seen her for a week. Feels like three. I know. So we're going to start now, but I'm going, to, I'm going to welcome my mother and we're going to go. Welcome, mom. Uh, I know you can't. There you are. Hey, mom. Hi. Hi, mama. We've missed you. We missed you. We're going to start. We'll just Hello? start the team, but we'll talk, I guess, afterwards. Okay? Yeah. Glad to have you back from vacation. She looks beautiful. <laughs> Lovely woman. I love you. You're awesome. Oh. Frank, did you met my mom? This is my beautiful mother, Deborah. Uh, hold on. And uh, this is Pastor Frank. He actually spoke at our church here re uh, locally recently. So, <coughs> yes. So nice we're to meet everybody. Nice to meet you as well. Nice Hello. to meet you as well. Yes. So you ready? Um, so so Acts chapter thirteen starts out. It's Paul's first missionary journey. I'm going to go ahead and have. My lovely bride, read the first verse and stop right there. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon. That was called, that, were, yeah. that was it's called, called. Neger and Lucius of Cyrene. And I don't know how to say this. Cyrene word. and Manane. 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 Yeah. Which had been brought up with Herod and Tetrarch. Tetrarch. And Saul. Okay, so. I'm going to be reading it again. So a lot of these verses will go fast, but this is going to be slow. There's some things I need to pull out that's really awesome right here in verse one. I want to start out by saying this. So there's a group of people called out to the public. It says right here, it says, now, now there were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. And then it says, as Bar Barabbas and Simeon were called. So Barnabas, Barnabas yeah. So that right, right here. That, that word church, now in the church, was it's called the ecclesia or the called out ones. Okay, so we, we have this word church and we're going to find out um, around Revelation, we don't hear this, this word church anymore, but it's called church or the called out ones. It's ecclesia. Now that we're in the church, 
that was at Antioch. Now there's, there's about 12 to 14 Antiochs, I don't remember, but this one's Antioch of Syria, modern day, um, well, we'll just, yeah, it's, it's of Syria. So he starts at Antioch and oddly enough, he ends up, he goes to Antioch and then comes back to this Antioch. So this one's the Antioch in Syria. Everybody got that? Syria. Yeah, Syrian Antioch. James, you got that, brother? Yeah. Okay. So he starts in Antioch, Syria. And it says that was called of Antioch a certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas. We know Barnabas, the son of encouragement, right? Um, and Simeon, that is called Niger or Niger. I don't know how they pronounce it, but that word Niger or Niger is means black. So it's very likely that Simeon was African American or probably North African. Not most African American. Yeah. yeah, not sorry, was not African American, but most likely North African. Um, Simon, that was called Niger, and Lucius is Cyrene. So they're building a group of people for a journey. And so it's really important to people that are mentioned here. And Lucius of Cyrene, or Luscious, I don't know how you pronounce it, and Menaean, which means the comforter. I think that's some of these notes I'll give you. I haven't gotten a word about like spiritual implications, and I don't know, but I will tell you what I found the meaning. The meaning of Menaean's comforter. You know, so I don't know what that means to you, which had been brought up like a foster brother with Herod. Now, this is Herod Antipas. Last week, we talked about Herod Agrippa, okay? So, this Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So, this doesn't seem like a whole lot. You know, you can keep reading. There's not a lot here, but there is a lot here. So, I want you guys to realize Herod, who we're going to find out, he's the guy that beheaded John the Baptist. This Herod, Herod Antipas, was brought up with Kind of like a foster brother with Menaean. Now you're going to find out he's comforter. That's a good guy. You get a good guy and a really bad guy, but they have the same upbringing. You hear these stories where, you know, you have, you have these people like um, Jeffrey Dahmer that did all these horrible things, but they have relatives that are like wonderful sister. You know, you know. So a lot of times you you see people blame their 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 life, either an upbringing, but we have a case of a really bad guy and a really good guy with the same upbringing. So we make a choice along the way. That's that's the point I think that I wanted to bring out here. So we go on this journey. So there was an ecclesia. There were called out ones, and at this journey, God's going to set apart a couple of people on this journey. So this is a mixed community. So I want to point this out. Um, I made a note. Menan and Herod grew up together. They were brought up um, very aristocratic. They were very privileged. They they both had money. I'm sure good wealth. They had solid upbringing. One was wicked, one was good. One turned out to be the wicked king who would behead John the Baptist and be over one of Jesus's trials, and he murdered God's prophet. The other one, Menaean, would turn out to be an outstanding Christian and one of the most outstanding churches of the early world, and he influenced hundreds of people. You have two people, but opposite, same upbringing, but opposite directions. Um, yeah, it's funny how we can start the same but take different paths. I think that's interesting. And so there's, we talk about the two types of prophets. I made a note of that here. I don't know if it, does it go here? Maybe not. I think that was from the last yeah, week. Yeah. So I want to go ahead and have Alana read uh, verse two real quick. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnab Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So we have this mission starting. We, we, they listed the people that are there. And then it says, um, as they ministered to the Lord. Now I want you guys to notice something right there. To the Lord and fasted. Remember, Jesus went on a fast for 40 days before he started his public ministry. So Saul, Saul knew some stuff. And the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work I have called for them. So, they have, so the Holy Spirit's like, I have a separate work for them, Barnabas and Saul. I have something for them. But first it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Notice it says to the Lord. Think about this. We often forget to minister vertically to the Lord. And I'm going to tell you what, what I mean by minister to the Lord. And it says right there, and fasted and separate me for the, uh, for the work whereunto I have called them. And that's the horizontal ministry. 
we have to, and I made a note here, um, at Antioch, they're certainly ministering to the congregation, but here they're ministering to the Lord. We normally think that ministry comes to us as spectators, like we're supposed to be spoken to. There's Amanda. We always think that we go to church and, and the pastor ministers to us, right? So these are, I find these to be little tidbits that are really important that we overlook. Hi, Amanda. So it says they ministered first to the Lord and then they went vertical and then horizontal. The reason why um, I made a note here, here they're ministering to the Lord. We normally think, I already told you that, but we're supposed to be ministering as much as receiving. So watch this. Number one, these are, these are good notes. Praise, I put, uh, praise was Old Testament sacrifi uh, sacrificed animal. That's how they did praise. And uh, they listened to his word example. I don't know why I wrote that. Hang tight, just a minute. Our horizontal praise to the people is strong, but our vertical ministry to God lacks. We so often are supposed to be ministering to God. In other words, you ever heard somebody say, you know, you spoke a word and you're like, man, that really ministered to me. That ministered to me. We're supposed to minister to him. In other words, he should be ministered to from us before we can receive to minister to others horizontally. Does that make sense? And so here they are. And the first missionary journey in Acts 13, 2, they're ministering to the Lord, not to the people for the work that they've called them. So verse, um, I want to make Is another. Ministered? Yeah, go ahead. So the, the Greek word for ministered, I don't really know how to pronounce it, but it's lead. I'm not sure. What's that word right there? It's uh, liat, liat, liaturged. Take oh, notes. liturged. Liturgy, no. like liturgy. No, look at the, all the way to end. So turgy. Dio. So, I don't know. Sergio, I it's don't know. Strong's uh, 3008. Anyways, it's performing religious or charitable acts, fulfilling an office, discharging a function, officiating as a priest, serving God with prayers and fasting. And then it says, compare litur liturgy with mm -hmm. liturgical. Sorry. Liturgical. I'm, yeah. Liturgy to liturgical. The word describes the, aer the aeronautic priesthood ministering Levitical services. In Hebrews uh, 10, 11, and in Romans 15, 27, it is used of meeting financial needs of the Christians performing a service to the Lord by doing so. And then here, the Christians at Antioch were fulfilling an office in discharging a normal function by ministering to the Lord with fasting and prayer. That's good. That's good. Thank you. You're welcome. So the point is, a lot of these verses, like I said, they're going to be read fast, but on these... I find a lot of stuff here that we really overlook and the fact that they're starting that Paul, well, right now he still saw he's starting his first uh, missionary journey. And the first thing he does is minister to the Lord. Does the Lord need our ministry? Does he want our ministry? Yes. Does he need it? No, but he needs, to, look, he should go, man, that ministered to me, that ministered to me. That's what he should be, he should be saying in his heart. And they make it a point here in Acts 2. And what's really cool, vertical ministry in order to do horrible horizontal ministry. In other words, if you, I say this all the time, think about this. If you and your wife are in a room together and you're, or in life, and you're trying to like, imagine you're, you, you have an oxygen mask. And I say this all the time, and you're trying to hand it back and forth to get air from each other, to make each other survive. No, no, no. You have to go to the source to get fresh oxygen or your marriage will fail. Mm -hmm. You'll fail. You can't use each other's air constantly. It doesn't work. I can't, Alicia can't survive off of Curtis. She has to be, you go, I'm half and you're half. No, we have to be whole to be one whole. We can't be halves or we're not going to be whole. We have to be our own person first. And we have to go to him horizontally, excuse me, vertically. Then God, then we can horizontally minister to our family and then the church. And so, I pointed that out to say this, too many pastors serve the people, this is right here in scripture in Acts chapter 13, too many pastors serve the people, but they're not ministering to the Lord, or they start a message as a habit, vain repetition, but they don't pray, and I'm not talking about just sitting down and, you know, like, they, they were praying and fasting, I'm talking about sitting down, writing everything off your Forget everything, and for a minute, just minister to the Lord, witness to him, be his witness for him, be with him, minister to him. 
It's not like he needs you to pastor him. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, offer yourself to him and then let him work through you horizontally to other people. Mm -hmm. Then we can start our Bible study. Right? So that's what I'm doing. We go to him. Then I can go to you guys. Otherwise, we're going to have a bunch of nonsense and me reading a bunch of notes. They're going to do no good for anybody. That's why I swear I was 12-1. Thank you. I didn't know that. I know. Well, beloved, present your living, your body's a living sacrifice. I and love how that. that which is holy and acceptable, which is my reasonable act of worship. That's uh, so the you know the the church the body of Christ, I mean I've I've heard it said times we are not there for ourselves, we do not gather unto ourselves, we gather unto Him. Come on, man. And yeah. and if I gather unto Him, as a people, as a body, if you know scriptural, He'll talk about individuals. But when he, the letters were written, they weren't written to individuals. They were written in context to the entire congregation. So the letter was written and spoken to the entire congregation. So all the context has to do as the one body of people. Now, it, it pertains and is applicable to me as an individual, but the context is a body of people, one body in him. So, um, but, you know, it's there's work to do. That's all. Brother Frank, can I ask you a question? That reminds me when Jesus wrote the seven letters to the seven churches, Revelation, it's interesting that, the, that each letter went individually to each church, but it also went to all the churches. Yes, it did. Because there was a message yes, from the body of Christ, but spoken to that body individually as well. And in fact, Laodicea, if you go to Colossae, was Colossae the was, they told, you take that letter and you give it and send it to the church of Laodicea. Laodicea, and you take the letter I've sent to you. Now you take that and go to Colossae. It's called translocal ministry. Um, so uh, it's, you know, um, That's good. but we're a work in progress. We're being sanctified and, and um, you know, but yeah, we, we saw and that's why worship is not singing and how it's a posture before god it, whether it's, it's, it's singing is just a one thing that i mean i should be worship i should be and ought to be worshiping in every aspect of my life that's work leisure uh song reading praying whatever it is it should be a worship unto him so um, that's what they do in the throne room of God in Revelation. That the all that's what we're going to be doing is a worshiping day and night. That's so amazing. Good word, Brother Frank. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say something on Acts chapter 13, verse 2, when we're going to verse 3. Notice how it said right there in verse 2, it said, Separate me, in other words, set apart. He didn't say in an audible voice necessarily, by the way. A lot of people they'll build doctrines and say it was audible. It doesn't say necessarily it was an audible voice. I don't know. The whole, it says the Holy Ghost said. Well, I'm saying some people, there's doctrines that will actually offer this verse. There's literally theology. I'm not going to get into it. Just for your guys' notepads, there's a whole theology that goes off of verse 2. I'm not even going to go there. That's another day. It says, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work. Now, I say that because sometimes we have to say no to some things to say yes to God's call. Does that make sense? Like, remember, remember the, earlier on in the book of Acts, um, the church uh, spread out and he held behind two people. I can't remember what it was, but sometimes we have to say no to some things to say yes to God's call. I want to say that. Go ahead and read verse three really quick, please. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. What's that say in what order? Fasted, prayed, and laid hands? One, two, and three. Did you see that? The patterns are right here in the Bible. We don't have to make stuff up. They fasted. They prayed. And they laid hands. There's one, two, and three. It's perfect outline. Fasted, prayed, laid hands. There's a lot of laying hands and a lot of casting out devils for not to believe it's real. And laying, laying hands, when it says laid their hands on them, is an act of spiritual impartation and commissioning. So you see that a lot in the book of Acts. You do. Notice it says, and when they had fasted, prayed, and laid their hands on them, comma, right after that, it says, they mm -hmm. sent them away. Some are sent. Some just went. 
that awesome? I love the Bible, man. I love it. I love the Bible. Okay. So this is widely believed uh, right here to be the first. I'm not saying it is, but this is considered the first known missionary trip. Like as a, as a body, this is what it's widely believed. Uh, many regard this as the first known missionary of the church as a body. Okay. Um, by the way, to be missionary means in Latin to be sent in Latin to be sent. Um, let's see here. That's what the word apostle means. That's all it means is one cent. Yeah. That's it. It's real simple. Yes. It is. You're right. Notice verse three. It says they sent them away. But in verse four, read verse four really quick, Ken. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia. Seleucia and from thence they called to Cyprus. They sailed, they sailed, they to, sailed Cyprus. to Cyprus. So what I think is interesting is right there in verse three, that word sent. I'll, I'll just put it to you this way. Verse, so first, first it's the church. And right here, it says, now being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. So first the church, now the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia and from then sailed to Cyprus. So this is about 16 miles from Antioch. This is a seaport area, okay, from Antioch, uh, Syria. Wait, depart unto, um, yeah, from Antioch seaport. The church can send someone out, but if the Holy Ghost doesn't, it doesn't matter. So here the Holy Ghost sends them out. Did you catch that? They didn't just go out on their own accord. And so, um, by the way, I have photos and all this. I have um, all diagrams and maps of all my notes. Amanda, if you wanted to have it all like pictures and everything, so you can see his journey. There's very specific reason. I believe a lot of times we really overlook maps. If you follow the maps and see what they're doing, there's certain things you can learn from the maps and the patterns. And I always ask the question, wait a minute. If he has to go this way to this way, why did he go up 18 miles and then go right back and keep going? Why would God, why would Paul just go up, 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 and then keep going? There's always a reason. Because he could have went anywhere. There was all kinds of areas, but he specifically went to specific areas. We're going to read about them. So that's a very short distance if you actually look at the map right here. I'm going to see if I can show you guys without sharing my screen. You see those, the little green and then the blue? He made a very short distance stop for some reason before he went further, and we're going to talk about that. So verse four, yeah, they sent, they sailed to Cyprus. Yeah, so Acts 13, verse four, this is the first stop. Okay, stop number one. Um, and I think, why did they go to Cyprus first? Why did they make that little stop? Why, why didn't they just keep going? I think something made them excited. I think we're going to find out why. You know, Barnabas is from Cyprus. Maybe that's why they made that quick little stop. Maybe there's something... Since Barnabas is from there, they went back to, they went to where Barnabas is from. Either way, the Holy Spirit sent them. Yeah. So. Well, I think there's, I think there's more to it though. That's the fun part. Verse five, go ahead. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. Okay. So right here, this, I, I told you, I have a lot of information on these first few verses. I want you guys, if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, uh, Saul saved number two serving number three he's sensitized to the Holy Ghost Holy Spirit saturated and now he's sent see that God is a missionary God he sends people on missionary journeys he loves sending people matter of fact word of God ministries Called, equipped, sent. That's their mission statement. He loves missions. I know I know some missionary friends of mine. So it says, and when they were at Salamis, which means salt, you know, you know, you guys read about the salt, uh, the saltness, we're the salt of the earth. Well, that word, when they were sent to Salamis, that means salt. They preach the word of God in the synagogues. Notice what happens here. Everything has a pattern in scripture, especially in the book of Acts. Every time you see Paul start, initially, he starts in the synagogues because he, he's a Jew. He's always going to go. He's a converted, saved Jew, but it's he's still, he, he likes to follow 
you know, Jewish culture. He's a Jew. He's a Jew of Jews. And so um, he preached the word of God first in the synagogues. And you guys know a synagogue is at least 10 people, 10 men to make a synagogue. So he's in the synagogue first of the Jews, the word of God to the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John Mark to their minister. So they, they gained a new person. Now, this John Mark is not John the um, John Gospel. That's not John the Baptist. This is the Gospel of Mark. His name is John Mark. Okay. And by the way, this is Barnabas's nephew. Okay. And that's going to play a role in, I think, a split that happens soon. I think there's, I'm going to give you scenarios why some offense could have set in and why they divide. This happens in churches a lot. Churches divide over jealousy and hurt feelings and same thing. So, we're going to, so we're having this beginning of the, so basically we're learning this first missionary journey, the things that happen on this journey. And so they got John Mark to their ministry and says in verse five, this is good noteworthy. So we're, we're, I know, I'm, I know I'm trying not to talk you all to death, but I'm trying to build what's happening here in this group of people because it's so important. Barnabas was a Levite. He was a Le all about Levitical law. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul was under Gamaliel. He was a rabbi, very well-respected heavily respected rabbi, as you guys know, from the earlier books of Acts. We hear about Gamaliel. Matter of fact, we're sure that I'm sure that Saul was there when Gamaliel, when they witnessed uh, Stephen. Stephen gets martyred, the first martyr. I think it was Stephen, right? Yeah. And we know that Saul yeah. was that. And he was under the, per and there's other things that happened under Gamaliel. And so Saul was under Gamaliel. He was a rabbi. Barnabas was a Levite. Keep that in mind. They were well respected and very well listened to. So, what perfect people to send on a missionary journey than a guy like Barnabas, who was a good lawman from the tribe of Levi, very respected. He'll be very accepted too. Somebody that, you know, if you send somebody into your church and they're speaking and they have a background, political law, they're gonna they're gonna have some respect. Or somebody like Saul, who was a very high, he was a um a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was somebody very respected. God knows what he's doing. So you have these two people that are going to be accepted into the synagogues because synagogues, they have this thing where they allow speakers um, into their synagogue. So these guys were famous. So they're very well respected. And the courtesy of the synagogue was a common custom. It'd be common to be asked to speak when you showed up. John Mark probably heard Jesus preach and was a valued witness. For Barnabas and Saul. So now they're highly respected and listened to, and now they have a very good witness with them. So what better way to start a missionary journey is to have credibility on both sides of the fence. Somebody that knew Jesus personally, and somebody that when they spoke a word, it was the truth. Even though we know Saul was messed up real bad for a while, he stood by what he believed, and he wasn't a liar. Neither was Barnabas. His name meant son of encouragement. So these are, remember Barnabas would, he's the one that brought Saul to Peter and them and said, look, hey man, he's doing the right thing. Let him in. So I'm not trying to beat that horse too much, but I want you to think of the group of people that God's putting together right now and why he sends them into this rough territory of the synagogue talking about Jesus. I'm going to tell you something that would not be very popular going to an area where he's rejected, knowing that you could be killed. And so yeah, so so John Mar uh, John Mark's a valuable witness. So Paul always started with the Jews, then the Gentiles, who were always eager to learn. Um, now, verse six, there's some interesting implications, and I'm going to let you guys decide for yourself because I can't. I'm going to use that word dogmatic, but they're fun things to think about. I'm going to have my beautiful wife read verse six. And when they had gone through the aisle unto Paphos. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Okay, Bar-Jesus. Now, this is where this gets good. All right, so, <laughs> Frank, I love this word, man. I was just looking at your face, man. You're right in front of me here. So, listen, verse 6. And when they had gone through the island unto Paphos, I got to tell you something interesting about Paphos. It means boiling. That word there means boiling or hot. They found a certain sorcerer. Now, what do we know very often, even though this could point to a specific man in the scriptures, what does it usually mean to us, the reader? Anybody? 
I say this all the time. It could have, it could be spiritual implication. It could be us. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, my speaker went out. Can you still hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Good. So when we yeah. see a certain, there was he went through an aisle called Pathos, and they found a certain sorcerer, which is a real person, but this could point to us spiritually. A sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. Now, anybody that knows the name Barabbas or Baraba or Baraba, you guys remember Baraba mm -hmm. or Barabbas? Mm -hmm. His name, they set him free and killed Jesus. Well, his name meant son of a father, right? Because Bar means son or son of in Hebrew. Abba means father. It's got an S, but the S is silent when you say it. It's Baraba, son of a father. But in this case, Jesus Christ is actually son of the father. There's only one father. Well, this name, Bar Jesus, but Jesus was a common Greek name. Many people had that name. But listen, Luke is writing this gospel, you guys. Now, how offended would Luke the writer be? Bar Jesus? I ain't calling him son of Jesus. Verse 6 just says his name was Bar Jesus, son of Jesus, a false prophet. Um, Paphos was pagan, known for malady and vocation. So what's interesting is we're going to find something out. Uh, let me hit admit really quick. Verse 7, I'm going to try to move this thing along. What's that, little Steve? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I think is interesting about this is, um, where did I leave off? lost my spot yeah his name is bar jesus and verse seven says which was with the deputy so this bar jesus this sorcerer right somebody's background Man. i can hear who's that what? okay so there was a there was a sorcerer named bar jesus but it says in verse seven which was with the deputy of the country sergius paulus a prudent man good man decent man who called for Barnabas and Saul desired to hear the word of the Lord. Hey man, there's nothing better than being called because they want to hear about God, right? But what's really interesting about this and the King James says deputy, a lot of other ones, uh, a lot of other versions says, which was with the proconsul is what your version might say. Okay. And that just means the highest officer. It's a Roman proconsul. It's the highest officer, highest ranking officer. <clears throat> Everybody with me so far? <clears throat> yeah. So this, so in context, this Bar Jesus, um, they found the sorcerer Bar Jesus, a false prophet, and he was with this Roman proconsul, this deputy of the country. So these are both. I'll just say it this way, and his name was Sergius Paulus. Now this is interesting too. This is a guy that wanted to hear about the Word of God, but his name Sergius means earthborn. And Paulus, just like Saul, will become Paul shortly. It means small or little. So his name together, yeah. Sergius Paulus, this is just something I noticed. I don't know if it means anything. Earthborn and little. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. So these guys are together. He was with them. He was, it was a good man, intelligent. That means intelligent or wise, prudent. And he called for Barnabas and Saul saying, hey, I want to hear, I desire to hear the word of God. Oh, but verse eight, but Elimus, the sorcerer, see what that says in verse eight, Elimus, he doesn't say bar Jesus that time. Remember, Luke is writing this. I think Luke in his mind's like, I will not call Elimus bar Jesus. Sounds too much like my savior. You see what I'm saying? I don't think he wanted to write that name, Bar Jesus. It sounds too much like the Son of God. Everybody still hear me? Because sometimes my audio goes out. Did I lose you, Frank? You still there? Yeah, I got you. Oh, he was still hidden up. Okay. I don't know if he froze up. What I think is really cool here is, yeah, but but Elimus, the sorcerer, a wise man, for so his name by interpretation withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from faith. So you have a deputy, a proconsul, trying to hear in verse 7 about, from Saul and Barnabas, to hear about the word of the God. But in verse 8, this Elimus, this sorcerer, this Bar-Jesus, was trying to turn him away from the faith. 
that's a bad thing to do. If you guys remember, Saul used to turn people away from the faith before he got saved. You guys remember that? Luke refused to call him son of Jesus. In verse 6, we get his original name, but Luke will not write that down on his scrolls when he writes this. And I think that's beautiful. That's what I think, right? So Elimus or Alimus or whatever it's called was trying to turn Sergus away from getting the word of God. Um, uh, Elimus basically was some kind of advisor to the proconsul. So he was somebody that was an advisory that was with him. Does that make sense in the last couple of verses? So you're probably somebody that gave advice to uh, Sergius Paulus. And the point is, he's like, no, trying to get in between and, and keep him from learning the word of God. But this is really cool. Write this down. Procurator, P-R-O-C-U-R-A-T-O-R, -O -O procurator, a, with a definition of procurator, would be Pontius Pilate, like the orders come from the emperor. But here we have a proconsul or a deputy, excuse me, yeah, a proconsul is like Sergius Paulus, the orders by the Roman Senate. So I made the note, I just put it out of order, that deputy, that proconsul, they get their orders from the Roman Senate. A procurator is like Pontius Pilate, he reports to the emperor. I want to make, see so I had notes about what the difference was. Hope that's not like too much information overload. I tend to do that sometimes. So verse eight says, but Elimus was a sorcerer. But verse nine, right after, this is important, right after Elimus tried to block this guy from that he was with as his, you know, guy giving him advice, right when he tries to block the word of God, look what verse nine says. Then Saul, here we go who is also called Paul. It doesn't say he named himself that. It says he is called Paul, okay? Which means little, because we learned that in verse um, seven. Sergius Paulus means little or small. Verse nine says, Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Wow. The moment he gets a new name in scripture is at the very point that Elimus tries to intercept this guy receiving the gospel. Did you see that? He gets a name, Paul. It's funny how God gives us a new name when we're in covenant with God. He gets this name, he says, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Now, it's customary for people to use similar but different uh, names according to their culture. So he was, so tell you this, Saul was named after King Saul, okay? Uh, but he was called Paul in the Roman culture. That's his Roman name, Paul. Means little. Saul means in demand or sought after. Paul means little. He changed his name. On the ninth, you guys may not know this, on the ninth day of his life, he was given his Roman name, Paul. But it's not necessarily called out in scripture. Did you guys know that? We all here? Everybody can hear me? We good? Okay. I decided to point that out. So his Roman name is Paul. So here's some notes. Um, I'm going to try to move it along. This is really good, uh, Alicia, if you're taking notes. He's a wrong. So Paul now, yeah. So this, this is awesome. Paul, he's, he's, he's a Roman legally. He's a Greek culturally, and I'll talk about why in just a second. He is a Jew religiously and he's a christian by the grace of god let's let's break that down real quick because it matters the first one he's a roman because his father had roman citizenship so he was called freeborn means he didn't have to be purchased plain and simple he's culturally am i moving too fast he's culturally a greek because he stands up uh, at the Areopagus, it's called. It's just a big rock in Athens. When you do some research, and he quotes two Greek philosophers um, just off the top of his head by memory. And he's very well read in Greek customs, culture, and literature, and all that. But religiously, he's a Jew because he's a trained rabbi under Gamaliel, the best, the rabbi of rabbis. So this is a Sadducee, excuse me, a Pharisee of Pharisees, Saul was. Not Paul, but Saul was, the old Paul. 
He was trained a rabbi at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem. But lastly, and most importantly, he's born again believer and unafraid. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. That's so good. I love this stuff, man. I can't help it. Why the speaker went out again? Are we good? Can you hear me? I'm just making noise, anybody. You got it. Okay, good. My audio, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, so that's a quick portrait of Paul. And we talked about what some backgrounds say Paul might have looked like with the unibrow, gray hair, bald, with a hook nose. We went into all his physical features that are known about him uh, a couple of times. Um, I, I made a note here. Herod Agrippa, from the last chapter, shined outwardly. And Paul shined inwardly, because if you look at the descriptions of Paul in some of these old history books, it says that sometimes he would shine like he's, he'd be normal. Other times it looks like he would shine like, a, like there was a glow coming off of him. So I made a note that Herod shined outwardly because he wore the fancy outfits in chapter 12. But Paul shined inwardly. I just think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so right here in Acts 13, verse 10, Paul is going to openly rebuke somebody. It sounds really like, ooh, that's harsh. But God, through the Holy Spirit, we're going to find out, appoints us to be bold in verse 10. Go ahead and read it for me. Though. And said, O full of all subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy ooh. of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Okay, it sounds like, wow, is that loving? Yes. Uh, oh, full of subtlety and mischief, thou child of the devil. Does that sound like a Christian to you, Frank? Yes. It does. It does. Paul was bold. Speak the truth in love. And there's a lot of, you know, stuff nowadays. If we say it, it's called hate speech. No, it's just truth. It's love. If just because you don't agree, agree with somebody or line up with their, all the stuff going on in the world that we're not going to go into, we don't have time for it. They call it hate speech. No, you're being too harsh. No, sometimes you're just telling the it's truth. The truth. It's, it's the truth. And yeah, so right it's here, it's so important. Verse 10, he gets his new name, Paul. Then he says in verse 10, oh, full of all subtlety, who was subtle in the garden that tricked Eve? He was more subtle. He was subtle. The enemy is subtle. And he says, verse 10, oh, full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child. By the way, that means a son, if you look in the, in the Greek, when he says thou child of the devil, a son of the devil. Remember Bar Jesus? which is oddly, ironically, the opposite of the son of Jesus. Even though it says it in his name, that's kind of irony. Oh, son of the devil. In other words, child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. Will thou not cease to pervert the ways of the Lord? Are you really going to get in the way of somebody that wants to hear the Lord because you're a sorcerer? There's nothing worse you can do than to, to keep someone from their salvation. That's awful. I like what my my bible says it says the fact that luke attributes paul's rebuke to the fullness of the holy ghost indicates he is acting as god's mediator mediatoral agent of divine judgment not speaking forth personal judgment or vindictiveness oh that's good that's a lot that's very good we're going to find out that's a good nugget it's good work we're going to find out as we read a couple of more chapters here for those of you that are bible students which should be most of the people in this room the book of Acts starts out, O Theophilus. And so these are the things that Jesus both began to do and all that. Acts starts out as, a, as, a, as it's picking up the end of Luke, of what Jesus began to do, which means he still is. And he says, O Theophilus. So we know that means God lover, Christian, friend of God. There's different analysis. Some people believe that, you know, whoever this Theophilus is, that he's saying, I have a point behind this. I just have to stay on track that he's speaking to us, the listeners, or it's widely believed that Theophilus means uh, lover of God or friend, that this, because as we know, back then, uh, physicians were actually low regard. They were, they were servants. And so Theophilus was probably likely his master, and, and Luke was a servant. He probably was ministering as he was writing down things for Theophilus. I think there was a conversion that probably happened. And we're going to find out in a chapter or two, you're going to start to see Paul speak excuse me luke as he's writing this gospel of uh, the acts you're going to start to hear luke instead of talking about paul 
he's going to he's going to talk like it's first person as if he's with Paul. It's almost like Theophilus or his master became friends or got converted or became Christian. That's why I was saying, oh, lover of God. Uh, uh, Luke was saying, oh, God, lover. He was speaking loving to his master, probably. And probably his master led him out to go on these journeys with Luke. We're going to start hearing Luke talk as though he's with Paul now, because we're going to hear about this guy from Macedonia. I think it is. And I believe it's pointing to Luke. So I said that because um, I thought it was important. We're going to start notice how Luke starts to talk about, and, and another chapter, I guess, about uh, this person that Paul meets on his journeys. And so I didn't mean to get so far off. Um, yeah, so I said, why would Paul say the son of the devil? It's interesting that Bar-Jesus in verse 6 said the son of Jesus, and there's a contrast. Um, Paul is saying son of the devil in contrast to that on purpose. Um, I made a note, uh, was Jesus harsh? He turned over the tables. He made a whip, Matthew 13. He said, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, like me and Frank were saying, Telling the truth and love doesn't mean you're, you know, with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're bad by telling the truth and being bold about it. And we see, we see signs of this. And now I got my thought. I know why I wrote this. Um, is, is he actually harsh? Because Jesus overturned the tables when they were gambling and doing all that stuff in the, in, in the table changing area. Matthew 13, he says, whoa, by the way, if he says, whoa to you, that's like he's cursing you. Not in the sense that we curse, but it's bad to hear. That's the worst word you want to hear in scriptures. Whoa. Matthew 13, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Oh, hypocrites. And then in John 8, he says, you're the children of the devil. Saul is simply telling the truth and doing what his master did. That's the point. I thought it was important to really stay there. It's okay if we tell people the truth and love. Agreed? Anybody have any input? Most, most uh, misused scriptures is thou shalt not judge. Oh, my goodness. Most misused and misunderstood. People don't even know that mean, it means to make a decision. They don't even know what they're... You can't judge me. Who are you to judge me? You're absolutely right about that. You're, you actually have to judge. You judge every moment of every day, pretty much. You have to judge people's fruits. That doesn't mean you're making a predetermined no. decision of something you don't know. But what you see and observe, you have to make a decision or a judgment on what to do. Or what to think. Frank, you're absolutely right, brother. That's a good word. I didn't mean to cut you off if I did. No, you're fine. Good. That's I'm going to probably have to go in about 12 minutes because i got to get my son to bed. Okay, we're going to try to wrap this thing up, and we'll we'll try to get to – I'm going to do a lot of reading. We'll probably get to 20 somewhere in there. So um, I want to make a note here um, on that, that thing about is it rude that Paul did what he did. I made a note in Revelation 3, 1, chapter 3, verse 1. It says – can you read it real quick in blue? And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art, de and art dead. Okay, right there. Jesus wrote in the book of Revelation and the, and the um, almost the last church. He's like, you have a name and you live, but you're dead. Well, the reputation's good. Yeah, but he was but bold spiritually, about it. they're spiritually, they're dead. They're dead. They're dead. And that points out this point. Bar Jesus had this name that appeared to be good, but he wasn't. Sometimes we get names that we don't live up to. It's too bad. He gave us a name with expectancy. I think that Bar Jesus, this, this guy, probably God had, a, you know, I don't know, had a plan for him to do something amazing. Because if you look at the other guy, he did. Just like we, we, we learned about the two guys at birth. One was Herod. One was the other guy but they went two different directions. He gave us a name. I think he had plans for us, but we ruin it so often. Um, and we'll go ahead and verse 13, uh, verse 11. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. Uh -oh. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Did you guys catch what happened right there? Anybody catch that? Was something very interesting in that verse, verse 11? A mist. Well, he says, behold, the hand of the Lord's upon thee. So Paul, remember we talked about prophecy? It could either be foretelling or forth telling. You're speaking the word of the God. The Let me explain. Of the Lord. Paul is not, is 
forth telling. He's just telling the Lord, word of the Lord. Foretelling means you're actually saying something before it happens like a prophet. So here Paul, through, through God, right, he says in verse 11, and now behold, the hand of the Lord, he's foretelling, excuse me, he's forth telling. The hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shall be blind. Well, wasn't Paul blinded as Saul? And here Paul now is saying, the hand of the Lord's upon thee, you shall be blind. That's what happened to Paul, but yet he's basically speaking the word of the God, the word of the Lord, saying, you're going to be blind now. It's not saying Paul did it, but he just speaks the word that now you're blind. You see that? That's what happened to him. And that makes me think. He says, you shall not be seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell upon him amidst in the darkness. Isn't that what happened to Paul or when he was Saul on the road to Damascus? A darkness for three days. It's almost like Saul had a conversion to be blind. Remember it says, my God says, our ear needs to be circumcised. We need to hear how he hears to cut away of the flesh. That's not necessarily physical flesh, but to cut away the world to hear how he hears. He blinds people to see how he sees, not how you see things. And here it is. Paul speaks forth a word from God. He says in verse 11, not seeing the sun for a season, he's blind. He's, it's dark. And he went seeking. And it says right here, in the midst into a darkness, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So here's this guy that's going to get in the way of somebody wanting to hear about God, just like Saul was going to go to, the, uh, to Damascus to kill the Christians. Like a leader, Saul has to be led into Damascus like a, like a, like a lamb. Blinded, time to re, just to rebirth inside of him. Three days. Paul says something here. This is what happened to him. And you know why I think it happened to him? If you read this, because... He knew this guy got directly in the way of someone's salvation as he did the same. Remember Stephen getting martyred? He actually kept people from being saved in Acts chapter 7. Saul did the same thing that this guy is trying to do. So Saul, Saul said no. He was blinded. I think he saw himself in this man. That's what I think happened. That's just me. Why would he strike him with blindness? Because Paul saw himself, I believe, and was blinded. He saw himself in, in Alimus or Elimus, wherever you want to call him. Paul's trying to help him, oddly enough, because he doesn't want him to go to hell. So he's bold and honest. Well, not only that, but who he was with. Sure. Oh, yeah. Not just that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of spiritual implications. Trying to move this on before you leave, Brother Frank. So verse 12, go ahead and read that. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So look what happens. Alimus tries to get in the way of this deputy, this proconsul. But instead, the bad guy is blinded. Instead of him not getting witness, he sees the guy being uh, blinded. And he gets saved because of watching the blindness. So it's not the blindness. Look what it says. Did he get saved because of the blindness? Because he watched the guy blinded? What does it say? Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed and being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Not the blindness. At first you would think the blindness, he was like, holy cow. No, it says he was saved and astonished because of the doctrine of the Lord. That means the word that he heard, not the actions. So about, about what just happened, um, I like this where it says, yeah. Paul was harsh in his confrontation against Elemis because the eternal destiny of the, the, pro, the proconsul, proconsul was at stake. And then if one wants to commit spiritual suicide, that's one thing, but it is never right to bring others down also. And if you want to give up on the things of God and grow bitter in your heart against him, that's your choice. But it is a heavy sin to draw anyone else away with yes. you, either with your words or your example. Think about all the people that Saul drew away. Remember when Stephen was the first martyr, how many people he must have. Literally, he went to their houses and persecuted them, keeping them from the gospel. Paul, who was then Saul, was so convicted by what he had done before he got saved. This is 10 years plus later now. Can you imagine how many nights sleep, even after getting saved, that he had to sit and think about what he did to Christians? think about that this is a guy that god knew was so bad 
but he was so dedicated to what he believed God knew he could use him. If he's dedicated for the right master, this is the guy he wanted, just like Peter. That's amazing. But look right here at verse 13. Do you have anything else you want to say? Verse 13 says, now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. Whoa, wait a minute. John Mark, did you catch that? Remember Paul, Barnabas, John Mark. John Mark knew Jesus, son of encouragement, Barnabas, and Paul, the leader. It says right here that, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. Why did John leave? Mark John, John Mark. Any ideas, anybody? Any thoughts? Somebody's got to have thoughts. Oh, where did Alicia go? Everybody's so quiet. Everybody can hear me? Or? Mm -hmm. No, we're going to still hear you. Yep. See Amanda's per thumbs up. Uh, Frank, do you have any idea why, any theory on why you thought John Mark just went back to Jerusalem? Any thoughts? No, I, I do my best not to read into something um and take it at face value of what it says and that i'm not going to know everything that is in it there's going to be mysteries of why um i it just it's too i can get in places i don't need to be when i start reading into the scripture i absolutely agree i think that's why i made a what i made is i made a list of like four possibilities that are just fun to think about but like you just said i don't know no i don't know yeah, I like to. I mean, I mean you know, they, you know, you'll see it later, but I mean, um, wasn't what he thought. I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, when we go to another side, then I can ask him. Right. Well, there's, I, I think it's fun to like, there, there's other stuff surrounding sometimes, and we're not going to know, yeah. but there's yeah. things like this can make you dig because if you look at other scripture, that, you know, who knows? Somebody could get the information and do whatever they want with it. Um, so I'm going to give you some things I that I noticed. And then people can, you know, obviously it's not dogmatic. There's no, I have no idea. I would go to what happened later mm -hmm. and find out what they, because of the such harsh disagreement they had of Max what 15. Paul said he left. I mean, you know, it's like he he just quit. Um, you know, and so I don't know. I mean, that's you know, that's 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 trying to read into the entire context of what all was going on. And so, but yeah. And you could hey, I agree with you. I the reason I say this, I absolutely agree with you. We don't know, but but there's interesting things that like to give people information I've found, and then they can yeah. Yeah, because the only reason I say that, we don't know, but it might allude to something that might enlighten them somewhere else in Acts chapter 15, that's all. And, and I'll, let me say what I was going to say so you understand the context. We don't know why John Mark left, but what we do know is uh, Paul and his company, there's a party I made, not Barabbas and Saul, Paul's leadership is obvious. So at this time, you'll notice that instead of Barnabas being listed and then, then Paul or then Saul, now it's always Paul and Barnabas. Remember who's uh, Mark, John Mark was related to? Barnabas. Now all of a sudden you see Paul listed first, and you'll see that throughout after this. Now these are just scenarios. I don't know. That's why when I talk to somebody about eschatology, what's that? That I'll, I'll give them a couple scenarios. That way they can go decide and look it up, at least to let them know what people, the different theories people have. And that's why I think it's interesting and fun. Uh, Paul's leadership is obvious now, but I want to note this really quick, and we'll, we're just about done. M number one, maybe Paul, maybe uh, John Mark's homesick. I don't know, but maybe, maybe he's homesick. Maybe that's too much. Maybe the maybe the fact that Gentiles, just pure Gentiles, can be fully converted. Maybe that was too much for John Mark, or maybe he was sick because uh, with malaria, because there was malaria, an outbreak of malaria at the time, or. Remember, Mark is related to Barnabas. Maybe there was jealousy over Paul being the first, uh, the first listed. Who knows? When we get to Acts chapter 15, we're going to find out something interesting about this breakup right here. Because Paul and Barnabas break up later in Acts chapter 15, and it could likely be 
because of this happening. So we'll talk about that later, but John Marks, the cousin to Barnabas. So uh, let's see. Yeah, later in Acts chapter 15, Paul does not appreciate the fact that John Mark, uh, Barnabas wants to rejoin John Mark returning to Jerusalem because later on in Acts chapter 15, Paul's like, no, I don't want John Mark back because he left. Um, and we don't know exactly why, but did you want to say something? Okay. Um, but we'll get into that later. Um, let's see here. Um, I don't know if I want to mention no, this or not. I move on. Let me just skip this. Yep. Well, this is where the offense thing happened. Yeah, but the, but you're going ahead of what's going on of the offense, and it's all speculation because we really don't know why. We can only we don't know, but we. I was talking about the part about you know the possibilities. Of, well, okay. I'm just saying for the sake yeah. of time. Okay, so um, there could have been friction. That's all. That's all we know. Go ahead and read, read verse fourteen. All right. Sorry. Fourteen. Yes. Okay. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into this synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Okay, I made a note here. The city is, is about 3,600 feet above sea level. It's a port city, it's at sea level, um, 3,600 feet tall at sea level. And um, let's see, same, let's see, the same guy founded, um, I didn't make a note here. I know that this Antioch is is the located as the present day Turkey. It's, yes. And it's not, the same as the Antioch in Syria. No, this is Antioch in Pisidia. This is where he went to before he comes back. This is like the furthest part out before he makes his trip back. And so um, the same guy founded um, like 13 or 14 Antiochs, by the way. Mm -hmm. This is another one. Um, I've made a note. Why would Paul head north out of the way of this one to go all the way up into the mountains? Maybe it's because he had bad health. Who knows? I don't know. But many people went north to escape to... Um, malaria fever um so it's very likely that's a possibility to go to the you know away from the lowlands i read a somebody made a note about that um let's see verse 15 go ahead and read that all right and after the reading of the law and the prophets the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them saying ye men and brethren if ye have any word of ex exhortation for the people say on Okay. Yeah, Paul was distinguished, immediately preached. Okay, so he immediately starts preaching. He was distinguished. And then, and then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, said, men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. Okay, so look at that in verse 15 before we close this out. So it says, and after reading of the law, the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, hey, men of brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on, keep preaching. That's a preacher's dream. Keep speaking. We want to hear it. That's that's a preacher's dream. Play off his reality yeah. track. I like that. Yeah. She, uh, Samantha made a note of the spiritual blindness when when he blinded the guy like like Saul was blinded. Or, uh, the rebirth came to new sight. Yeah, it's a spiritual blindness. I like that. Um, let's see. Yeah, it says preach on. So I made a note. Perga was a coastal harbor city. I don't need to read that. Mm. Um, they went from. I don't need to. They don't need to know that. So yeah, they. Uh, if you have any word for exhortation, preach on. I made a note about Galatia. I don't know why I made that note. See you guys. Bye. See you later, man. Bye, bud. Have a blessed night. You too. Uh, Frank. See you later, brother. Uh, I made a note that Galatia refers to a region, not a city. This is an area they're preaching in, like Ephesus or Corinth or Philippi. Several cities within or within Galatia. Something you want to say? No. Okay. Um, this is Paul's first recorded sermon. And he says in verse 16, then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hands said, men of Israel and ye that fear God give audience. So God fears are people that were not fully converted. They didn't know Jesus. But remember, we talked about Cornelius. He was a God fearer and men of Israel. So God fears are just, yeah, they're Gentiles or friendly to Judaism. Men of Israel just means the Jews. So there's a lot of mixed crowds when Paul stands up to preach his first sermon. That's that's the point. And so he says right here, we'll just read it real quick. Um, this is his first sermon. This is actual first complete sermon. He said a lot of things, but he preaches here. Verse 17, read 17 through 19. The God of this people of Israel choose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an high arm brought them out of it 
And about the time of 40 years suffered, he their manners in the wilderness through 19. Mm -hmm. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Chanan, he divided their land to them by lot. Okay, I want to keep So this is basically Paul preaching Israel's history, a survey. So read verses 20 all the way to 23. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. So here he is. So Paul's given this history. He's doing a history story, basically. And he says, and after that, he gave them judges about the space of 400 years. He's talking about the 400 years in Egypt. There was 40 years in the wilderness and 10 years conquering and settling in the land until the time of the judges. So he's basically covering that time frame. He's kind of going over that. Um, and then in verse 21, the desire, it says, you know, remember how the people desired a king? They needed David and all that. Um, they, want, they wanted a king, King Saul, sorry, was who they got. The son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. That was during that 40 year period. Um, Saul was a Benjamite for 40 years. And did you read verse? No, you stopped me at 20. I'm so sorry, honey. You're okay. No, I'll read 22. Yeah, read 22. When he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Verse 23. Of this man's seed has God according to his promise raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Okay, so... Um, you notice in 23, the point was, he said, of this man's seed, the God according to his promise raised unto Israel's Savior, Jesus. So he's telling the story. Jesus is raised from the dead. He goes through the whole thing. In 23, basically, the point is Paul is focusing on showing them how through the seed of Jesus, we got our blood, uh, excuse me, through the seed of David all the way up how we got Jesus. But basically, he was just focused on that lineage. He just, in a nutshell, told the story. And so in verse 24, it says, when John the Baptist that's who it's talking about. First preach for his coming. And 25, he goes on what he did. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Who think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Okay, we're going to wrap this up on this verse. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, don't know, I lost everybody here. Um, he says, of the, he's talking about John the Baptist in his first sermon. This is his first full sermon. So John the Baptist said, you know, basically there's one that comes before, I came before him, but he was preferred before me. And John the Baptist says, I'm not worthy to unloose his sandals. And that's interesting that he would say that because this is a context that I didn't realize until a couple of weeks ago. Um, because in ancient times, a rabbi and a, disciple had an actual legal contract and so they had rules on how to handle and how to deal with the disciple this is really interesting amanda you'll like this you've heard i'm not worthy to loose your shoes paul's telling the story about john the baptist right we always think well i'm not worthy to loose your shoes but but it's deeper than that because if you understand that contract that a rabbi in order to become a rabbi you had to have a disciple and you had to be under a rabbi to become a rabbi but there was a contract and you, um, to be attached to a rabbi as a disciple. There were certain things as a rabbi you could ask a disciple to do, right? But there's certain things you could not by law, like that's, no, 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 that's beneath them. You know, like we might say, well, I, I work for you, but I'm not washing windows. So there was something was considered way too low to have your disciple do. And one of them, one of the lowest things you could have them do is to unbuckle your shoes. Like you can't do that. And it was said if a rabbi, um, it was going too far. So John, when he says, I'm not worthy to unloose your shoe, he's saying what people call lower than low, I'm not even good enough to do that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That makes that statement that much more powerful. I'm Jesus. I'm not even Paul's telling this. I'm not even good enough to do the lowest act when it comes to you. I think that's beautiful. and so. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Yeah, I'm going to leave it there for tonight. Um, and we're going to pick up verse 26 next time. And when he's going to go on to talk about the children and the stock of Abraham, we're going to keep going with that. So um, I feel like I fucked everybody to death tonight. Everyone can hear you when you said that. Yeah.
I know. Did I talk you guys to death? No, not at all. If you guys weren't bored out of your mind, anybody get anything out of it tonight? Oh, yeah. Why don't you Good. close us out in prayer? Good. Okay, I'm going to close out in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time tonight. Thank you for your word being here tonight. Thank you for being with us and just uh, sharing your message with us to talk about it. And we just hope that this um, that this benefits someone. That that anything that anybody heard tonight, just if it's not of you, that they just it just be removed from their ears and from their hearts. And Father, wherever everyone goes tonight, just be uh, with them when they leave. Cover them. Be their forerunner, their rear guard. Father God, we thank you for this time. We're blessed to have it. Well, we can't wait to see you next week and do the same thing Tuesday at 630 and we get we finish this up. Um, we give all the grace, all the glory to you, Father God. And we thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Love you guys. Love you too. See you next Love time. Love you, Amanda. Love you, James. Love you, Steve. See y'all. Bye-bye.